Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's learning session, MRV and Reference Levels, Six Years of Learning Through Practice, organized by WWF Forest and Climate. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. My name is Emmeline Gasparini, and I am a program associate with the Forest and Climate team. Our presenter today is Naikoa Aguilar Amuchasegi, who is um, the Director of Forest and Carbon, Sci Carbon Science here at WWF Forest and Climate. Um, next slide, please. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few logistics and some frequently asked questions. For those of you who have participated in past sessions, this will sound familiar. But yes, today's presentation is being recorded, and you can find the recording within a few days on our YouTube channel. To get to the recording, simply go to youtube.com and search for WWF Forest and Climate. There are two audio options. You can listen through your computer or dial in through the phone number that was provided in your registration email. It is important to note that if you experience audio difficulties while listening through your computer, those are sometimes caused by having too many browser windows or programs open at once. So feel free to close some of them, which usually solve the issue, or you're always welcome to join by phone. If you continue to have technical difficulties, please send us a message via the chat area and we'll try to get it sorted out. Um, questions are absolutely welcome. You can send your questions at any time during the webinar using the toolbar on your screen. We will answer as many as possible during our allotted time. After the webinar, you'll receive a link in your follow-up email with additional forest and climate resources from WWF, including a link to the YouTube channel where you can watch a recording of the session. Thank you again for joining us, and with that, we'll get started. Nikoa, you want to change the slide and take us away? Thanks a lot, Emeline. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> what we're going to be talking today is about an exercise that was carried out in one at the end of uh, last year. Uh, basically, it's a result of a work that has been going on uh, from WF for the last six years. Uh, WF has started supporting MRD development since 2009, thanks to uh, resources provided by the Norwegian Agency for Development, NORET. And the work that uh, we have been doing has been uh, led by the red teams in the different red countries that we have been supporting, as well as uh, the team that we I am a member of, which uh, was originally the Forest and Climate Initiative, then became the Forest and Climate Program, and now it's the Forest and Climate Team uh, located in the red US. The way we have been doing this has been uh, with a special emphasis in finding uh, the best uh, approaches, uh, viable approaches, and efficient approaches towards delivering uh, what MRV, uh, the MRV process is supposed uh, to deliver. Um, also aim aiming at building capacities for the long run in these places, not just uh, focusing on delivery of products, but really think about the process for the long term and its long term uh, sustainability. And a key part of that has been the collection of the learning, uh, the lessons along the process, which one of the results of that is what we're going to be talking about uh, today. Of course, the idea is that these lessons are shared with uh, folks like you guys today, as well as the decision makers, in the hopes that uh, it will make it easier for the implementation of the Red Plus uh, mechanism. Um, the workshop was done in 2012. Uh, 2015, uh, in November, uh, the idea was to collect lessons learned by the participants through their uh, daily work on MRV. The premise was that perhaps those who actually do MRV and have to deliver on that uh, had a lot of lessons to share and experiences that uh, could collaborate in a south, south uh, strengthening process. We had participants from the six focal points that we had been supporting as a program, uh, for namely Colombia, Peru, Indonesia, Guyana, Democratic Republic of Congo, and Paraguay. Uh, experiences from participants range from uh, uh, reporting directly to UNFCCC as part of the work that they have been doing for the last six years, uh, experience reporting to bilateral and multilateral agreements, uh, because their countries have bilateral agreements with specific country or several countries with uh, 
some other countries, for example, uh, other members, uh, which entail performance-based payments already, uh, reporting and or engaging into the World Bank's forest carbon partnership facility your programs, uh, national and subnational design, and of course this meant that uh, they had been uh, exposed to a plethora of capacity building experiences or technologies that had been put uh, at their reach by donor agencies and supporting agencies. <clears throat> the exercise basically care was carried out in three stages. The first one was the reconstruction, which is basically an exercise that we carried out to reconnect uh, the participants with the process of uh, building their capacities and or carrying out MRV activities for the last six years. So many times you come to a workshop in which you're aiming at uh, sharing lessons, but somehow you have forgotten things. And then you usually come back and then you say, oh, I forgot to talk about this. So in order to avoid these type of things and try to collect as, much, as many lessons as possible, what we do is carry out a, a reconnection process in which we use the analogy of a tree. So we identify with the participants uh, what was the baseline and particularly the date when the process towards working on MRV had begun and what were the, the conditions uh, at the time. This could be enabling conditions or these could be uh, limiting uh, conditions. This is made just to have a general idea of what the baseline was at the beginning of the process uh, uh, in 2009, for example is when we began working on this. Um, then we try to build a tree, since we're talking about trees. And what we do is to try to identify with the participants the milestones that uh, they have uh, been able to reach through the, their work in developing capacities, delivering products, implementing the process of doing uh, MRV. Uh, part of that work also includes the activities, so they need to identify which activities are the ones that they have been engaging into or did that were actually positive, that were actually helping, helpful to move forward uh, the implementation of the MRV process, but also identify activities or leaves that fall off the tree that really didn't contribute uh, to the process or were rather a distraction or they were uh, failing failure, failing attempts to, to move uh, the agenda forward. Uh, these, of course, are keeping in mind that this has been actually a learning by doing process. Uh, the achievements, of course, need to be highlighted. What are the biggest achievements, the things that they feel proud about of the process that they have been working on for the last six years? Uh, it's important just to highlight and reconnect themselves with those things that make them feel proud about the process. Uh, the context uh, within which all this process has happened, uh, this includes not only capacity but also poly political context uh, and so on, as well as partnerships of which we ask the participants to identify uh, helpful partnerships, just like the water here, and also not so helpful partnerships or characteristics, which is uh, mostly going towards, okay, which partnerships are the ones that have actually helped you with the process or the conditions of that such partnerships and which ones have actually not been helpful or the conditions that are for you and then you need to keep that in mind. So all in all, what these allowed us was to build three main trees, the MRV or M, one for monitoring and measuring, the other one for verification validation and then the third one for reporting. Once this reconnection with the process was carried out, participants shared the process with, uh, amongst themselves, we could find common grounds, uh, differences, particularities, peculiarities, depending on which country we were working at, under which conditions we were working on. And then after that, we engaged into uh, in that discussion of topics on areas specifically related to them or being specific questions that you could discuss. So I'm showing these here just to, to have a general snapshot of the kind of questions that we were discussing, but by no means try to, to read these, because we were discussing basically all the aspects related to the process of the MRV and then try to figure out what the lessons were. Okay. Uh, the results, well, participants delivered a very substantial amount of information and lessons uh, they were expected
package the, the, the milestones and all the information that we put in the trees into, into uh, substantial uh, statements and lessons that are the ones that we're going to be conveying today to you. And they were supposed to cover all reference levels and MRV related topics and areas. Some areas are cross-cutting. So they're not peculiar to specific elements and components of the M, the R, the V process, or the reference levels. Or, uh, and some, and uh, some of them are related to specific country capacities and capacity building processes. So it's not just the MRV system, but also the process that countries have been going through in terms of the, the, the readiness phase. And also uh, lessons on major context elements like policy, institutional arrangements, and finance, particularly when thinking about the long term sustainability of the MRV process. Okay, now getting into the results. Uh, <clears throat> we split the results in different areas or components of the MRV system. So we begin by the activity data. Uh, the main lesson that we have there is about on change data, particularly, is that the context is essential. Uh, this was a matter of uh, quite a bit of uh, discussion uh, because countries have been exposed to a lot of uh, different algorithms and data processing approaches and things like that. And then there is the issue of if you have the best algorithm or the best tool or, or these type of you know, discussions that countries have in terms of capacities. But then uh, uh, there, we felt, or participants felt, that there was not a whole lot of emphasis in the fact that no matter which data you use, uh, at the end you need to have information and access to ancillary data uh, uh, to really interpret on if the change data is relevant or not. So post-processing of change data is always necessary. Uh, and that includes use as much ancillary data and context data as possible as to you know, eliminate spurious and non-relevant change from your, your what you will be uh, reporting uh, afterwards. So natural dynamics are important to try to be uh, understood uh, and so on. In terms of the uncertainty, big word, big worry there. Uh, always well, turns out that uh, it's going to be there always. So uncertainty uh, is always going to be probably higher. That's what we would like it to be. But then one key point here is that even though we're being asked as MRV years, uh, the the expression, but MRV people, uh, to lower uncertainties, we need to recognize the fact that uh, change data, being the smallest part of the landscape, will always have a high uncertainty or higher than we, we like it uh, to be. So um, that's something that needs to be recognized both by implementing countries but also by donor countries. So that's I think it's a key, key point that we put on there. Uh, the other aspect is that um, uh, the periodicity of the production of uh, change data uh, is something that perhaps needs to be discussed a little bit further. Uh, the experience of participants was that uh, doing, for example, change generating change data uh, with high periodicity, let's say every year or every six months. Is interesting from a management perspective, but perhaps for reporting is not very wise because the uncertainty of such data is high because you would hardly be uh, reporting what we could call consolidated change. So basically, the point here is that participants found important to convey the fact that accumulated consolidated change would always show lower insert uncertainties, and perhaps that's the best way uh, to, do, to do so when, when reporting. Uh, so, here is that. One key uh, aspect, uh, forest definition. Uh, countries are all, uh, or most of the countries are you know, trying to figure out or have a way and so what the forest definition is. But there is a, uh, there was a common uh, sense that uh, the relationship between the forest definition, with, for example, it's three dimensions, you know, three, three high percent recover, and minimum area. With the data that countries are using, uh, that we are using to inform on deforestation and hopefully on degradation as well, uh, needs to the relationship of such data sets with the definition dimensions of the forest uh, that the country has, particularly the minimum area, 
uh, need to be made explicit, and actually the relationship needs to be used in the way the data are are used to to report on, um, for example, deforestation and degradation. So, for example, the spatial resolution of the deforestation data is not the same as that of the tree cover data or the remote sensing data that you will see. Uh, there needs to be hopefully smaller or higher spatial resolution, I would say, from your uh, data that you used to inform the condition of your forest units, if you want to call them, or minimum mapping units. The reporting units should meet the minimum area component of the forest definition. So if you have one hectare, uh, you need to use higher spatial resolution than half one hectare to report on, for example, for sensory cover, things like that. And then the, the change data should have adequate resolution to inform um, in, in a way that you can actually estimate those aspects of tree cover percent and, and, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> so when you really establish a relationship between your remote sensing data and your minimum mapping unit, uh, you would expect that your activity data uh, would be the aggregation of, for example, tree cover data into minimum map mapping units. Uh, and what these can do is that it can uh, reduce the uncertainty in the numbers that you're going to be reporting. Because as you aggregate uh, raster data into larger units, uh, you are going to be lowering the uncertainty in your, in your reporting uh, estimates. Another big uh, lesson, uh, there's mostly been a culture of doing wall-to-wall -wall, uh, data, using wall-to-wall -wall data to report on activity data. However, uh, it's interesting to remind, uh, and it was interesting for participants, to be reminded that uh, you're not, you don't really need uh, to have wall-to-wall uh, -wall data to comply with the MRB process. We can use sample uh, data. However, it was agreed that wall-to-wall uh, -wall data are ideal for implementation. Basically, uh, what's the impact of what I'm doing specifically where, basically on a, from a management perspective, but for reporting is not uh, necessary. But um, what was really emphasized was that no matter which approach you use, you need to be consistent. And that means that you need to be consistent between the reference level and the, you know, the approach that you use uh, towards the MRB. So if you develop a reference level that has been made based on sampling data, this sampling approach needs to be transparent, clearly uh, described. Uh, for example, sampling error needs to be estimated. I'm linking it to the point number two here, uncertainty. And also, the MRB also needs to be sample-based and follow uh, a similar approach. So you can actually compare apples with apples and instead of trying to compare apples and oranges. For example, mixing a reference level that has been made out of samples and then you are not dealing with wall to wall data uh, well violates the principle of consistency uh, there. All right. In the special case of degradation, uh, because you know we're now all in this process, uh, countries have submitted their reference levels to the UNFCCC. Degradation is a big topic. Uh, because it's kind of like a moving target. It's hard to define. It's, uh, it's not well defined, but it's difficult to measure it. Uh, one of the things that was uh, conveyed by participants is that uh, implementing countries or donor countries need to recognize the fact that uh, this we're in a learning by doing process. You know, it's trial and error um, uh, is important. And uh, that trying is probably better than not doing anything, and perhaps uh, a constructive feedback is the way to move forward with this. So, um, direct measurement of a loose concept is going to be difficult. So, direct measurement of, uh, of degradation will be extremely uh, challenging, even though from a, a scientific perspective, it's, it's the hopes. But then, uh, it's going to make it also challenging in terms of attribution. So you can look at how carbon fluxes and, uh, happen, let's say that we get to do it real time with very high spatial accuracy, but then attributing the changes to specific cause and effects uh, is going to be challenging. So the signal to noise ratio can become a real problem. So direct measurement is interesting, but it's going to be very challenging. 
Um, there's a lot of approaches being tested and reported. For example, Mexico, in its reference level, submitted an annex explaining how they were intending on measuring uh, the violation, which is interesting because it allows for feedback uh, to occur. So that's something that uh, actually in a second workshop that we did uh, recently involved on reference level, uh, participants were uh, discussing that it's interesting that countries expose their, how, you know, what they're trying to use towards uh, declaration in this case. Um, there was a lot of um, worry expressed by some participants on the temporal dimensions of degradation. Basically, it's the fact that, well, supposedly the change is supposed to be long-lasting and we're reporting on a biennial basis. So actually, do we really consider uh, that time, uh, time window the right one or not? Or is it just going to be limited to the physical change that we're observing? I mean, there's a lot of, of factors. Uh, which will make you know, uncertainties uh, larger, even larger than for the station and therefore much more uncomfortable uh, to deal with. Some of the participants uh, say that perhaps the best approach could be towards stratification. If you use a smart stratification approach rather than try to measure the gradation directly, what you can do is to try to link uh, the locations where you know the gradation is likely to be or is actually occurring and then link it with some of the strata that you're going to be reporting on and, and then link it with uh, management uh, and mitigation actions and even going further and then try to actually link that with the greenhouse gas inventories and now with the, after the Paris Agreement, uh, the new expression that has come up which is the global stock take. So linking everything to the land sector. So, uh, there was a lot of emphasis on rather than trying to actually measure it, perhaps what we need to make a lot of uh, our efforts into is into um, doing stratification that actually makes it easier uh, to come up with accurate estimates, but also uh, to manage it from an implementation uh, perspective. In any case, um, uh, the point uh, that was made is to uh, emphasize uh, to link whatever uh, you do is actually to use your forest definition. So always go back to use of your. So forest definition is not just a formality that you put, but actually uh, it's something that you can base yourself into for the design on the stratification and how you, what you will be calling the presentation and what you will be calling the kind of declaration. So uh, that's kind of the message. In terms of emissions factors, the stratification uh, topic uh, showed up again, uh, and and particularly the fact that you need to remember what data will be used for and how. So it should be a stratification that's purpose built. Um, of course, in many cases, country circumstances and the fact that there is no, for example, a national forest inventory for a lot of the information that we have for emissions factors comes from plot data and from the stratification approaches that were designed for other purposes and in many cases for misty, for ecological stratification and things like that that we're used to for. But, uh, when thinking about RED, uh, we need to think about the future use of the data. So stratifying and thinking about the greenhouse gas inventory, the necessity for a consistency between, well, there's not, it's not a mandate, but it's wise to have a consistency between the greenhouse gas inventory and the red uh, activities and now with the land sector as a whole, which is the next thing that's coming, um, is important. Uh, also, as I said, the management and the benefit sharing are also something that perhaps need to be kept in mind. So, uh, participants uh, say that stratification is your best friend for uncertainty reduction and the use of proxy, proxies, uh, for example, for degradation, uh, not, as I mentioned already, not perhaps not try to measure it directly, but use of proxies of uh, where it's happening and what the results might be is interesting. And, um, and always remember the fact that you're going to be reporting change. So, so when you when you stratify in a way in which the change you report is actually uh, the change, the move from belonging to one strata to another, 
perhaps you were saying that there's got a whole lot of work on, on Helix. So that's uh, the lesson on stratification. Uh, part of the experience of participants included uh, the elaboration of carbon maps, not only as a way we have engaged into these processes in uh, more than one country. Um, and we've learned uh, that uh, they're not essential for MRV reporting for Red Plus. Uh, this, could, this came up as a shock <laughs> to some, some uh, of the participants. Uh, but when you really understand the reporting framework, you, you, you quickly understand that you don't really need a carbon map to generate emissions factors, even though it's, uh, it's good ways uh, and what, to, to understand uh, the distribution of carbon information that you need to develop a carbon map is certainly the same one that you need to elaborate uh, accurate emissions factors. And also, the carbon map itself can help into uh, doing well what we were talking about just now, the stratification. So they're good for planning and understanding distribution uh, patterns of carbon, but by no means they're essential for delivering sound with emission factors and for reporting. You need good estimates for your strata, so you can map well your strata, uh, that's perfect. And if you have a, not a good carbon estimates for your strata, that's what you need. Uh, and that means a large enough and good enough sample size. Sampling most reflect the stratification of the country we are using the implementation process and deliver the adequate carbon estimate. And um, remember that local estimates, let's say at pixel level versus aggregated data, uh, well, that can be a, a double-edged razor game in which, well, you can try, what happens is that you can have a lo very local estimate at the pixel level, but that local estimate is going to have very high uncertainties, whereas if you aggregate the data, at the strata level, then you will reduce your uncertainties and you have a more manageable estimate to deal with when talking about benefit sharing. Because, for example, you can never prove a negative. I can have a high carbon hectare that belongs to me, but I can never prove that I was not, that I was going to cut it next. So when you think about that in implementation and how data are actually going to have to be used when discussing matters such as benefit sharing, um, you know, having very local estimates is probably not, not, not very useful. The uncertainty, of course, of emissions factors. Uh, well, you always have to identify. So estimate, aggregate to strata. But above everything, uh, you, have be, you have to be transparent about how you do uh, things. So well, we discussed, for example, allometric measurements in the field, how to measure DBH, measurement error, and then how it goes into the allometric error and then the elementary equation selection, which is the cause for a lot of heated discussion, depending on where we are at. Do we use the ones with height? Do we use the ones without height? Can we actually measure height? I mean, all these kind of discussions uh, that you have to deal with when you're actually trying to estimate carbon in the field and then how you move from plot data to stratum data, the sampling error, uh, all these things uh, are really important. But uh, the conclusion is that uh, basically what you need to be is transparent about uh, everything. And, and that the, the uncertainty source changes as you move uh, from uh, local to strata to supranational to national estimates. No matter what you do, uh, the relevant scale is what you is that which reporting, uh, you have to remember the scale at which you will be reporting and that those emissions factors need to uh, be useful uh, according to that scale and the, the way management and the strata that you are going to deal with. So keep that in mind. So perhaps considering implementation is all, always uh, um, interesting. So it's not just about measuring for the sake of measuring, but also thinking about implementation uh, is, is useful. And that's it's linked with, of course, the national forest uh, inventory. It's the ideal situation. However, not all of the countries have access to it or to them, or uh, there's never it's never happened and it's just beginning to happen, or it has happened but it's not useful or the certification is not the adequate one. But you know, under ideal circumstances. Uh, the design would be optimized based on the certification that you have, the implementation actions that you're planning on, on, on having, and of course, it should inform your emissions factors. 
in a way that the circuit is going, going, going over. However, that's easier said than done. Because, well, you will face budget constraints. Now there's a lot of subsidies uh, from coming from abroad to those countries, but that doesn't mean that, for example, the data is going to be replicable in the future. Uh, will there be a second measurement? So permanent plots. So uh, you need to get the biggest bang for the buck. Try to make it a multi-purpose purpose, uh, inventory. So if you're collecting data on carbon and really feel you might as well be collecting touristic data and also as in some cases that we've seen, for example, this came back from Paraguay, the inventory is also collecting data on social uh, aspects. So try to, to as you go to the field, well, you might as well just collect as much information as possible. Once again, link it to stratification. Um, do not discard existing data. Cap try to capitalize as much on existing data, uh, either by using it directly or using it to inform the stratification approach and the design that you would be using in National Forest Inventory. Uh, that's always a, a smart thing to do. And then, uh, well, we had quite a big discussion on the plot size uh, and these type of things. But the feeling of participants is that uh, even though there's a lot of subplot views and, and uh, use of cluster, clusters and things like that, uh, an analysis of the representativity of the, of the subplots or the cluster uh, is important. And, uh, but if you can link your forest inventory with your um, plot with your minimum mapping unit and your uh, forest definition in minimum area, uh, participants have to feel that that is for the smart thing to do. Now, moving into reporting, um, well, uh, a lot of the countries, the reporting that they had on was mostly on reference level. Some had already done uh, MRV reporting, particularly in the case of Guyana, uh, as part of the bilateral agreement with Norway. Uh, but in terms of reference levels, uh, a key lesson, uh, particularly when you're a technical uh, guy and then you, you're trying to do your best thing and, and you're trying to deliver the best thing, uh, is the realization that at the end, things like uh, what's reported under the MRV process. And part of that reference levels, uh, well, we're not part of the MRV process, but we're all putting together right now because we never see that it's a data informed political uh, decision. And uh, that means that all the elements of building a reference level are a political decision. For example, uh, um, how you interpret country circumstances, uh, um, how how you interpret historical period. What is a representative of historical period? Why are you aiming at this historical period as opposed to this one? Why isn't it is the case that there is no standardized interpretation of historical period? The other thing is that um, several reference levels can result from the process of the data that you're producing. You can have a historical. I put it in quotation marks because <laughs> there's very way, many ways of historical. But then you can you can also derive a, a performance reference level. So you can have okay, this is my historical reference level, but I'm going to start assessing my performance at this reference level, which could be an upwards or downwards adjustment. And then in an agreement with another country, the country can tell you, OK, well, that's very good. I like it, but I'll start paying you once you're below this at this level. Or I'll start discounting your payments uh, if you go above this level, which is the, the case that, of what we, we saw uh, the last uh, five years uh, in the Guyana and Norway agreement. So just to emphasize the fact that it's the data that you can produce uh, well, only goes as far as, uh, as, as it goes. And then uh, the way the data are used, um, well, it's a political decision. And then here comes the game of uh, what is it that we consider legitimate um, or not. Now, from a double bed perspective, of course, it's desirable that whichever way you use the data, you're aiming towards uh, climate integrity. Uh, and, of course, compliance with guidelines or methodological frameworks does not guarantee that. I mean, you can be compliant with the requirements of the convention. You can be compliant under the requirements of, for example, the 
forest carbon partnership facility network. But that doesn't mean that you really deliver your own carbon. So that's something that I want to get the chance to to highlight. Uh, uh, the issue of scale was a big discussion about the reference level. Should we go uh, national by default? Should we go subnational? What happened to the projects? And this is something that has been going on for quite a while already. And at the end, I think that the opportunism, as we all came to the general agreement, that it needs to be built at a significant scale for national people, so large enough, and it needs to make sense. And by that, uh, what's meant here is that, for example, uh, it needs to make sense from a national implementation strategy design, for example. Where are the areas where I'm going to be doing this or that, and I do, it, do I really understand the big picture? And the reason why this, this is kind of like the message is because the, the whole is not the, the addition of the parts. You can zoom into an area and say, oh my god, this area is really important. But when you do, you, you get yourself, you put distance between that specific area and you look at the whole complex, for example, at the subnational national level, perhaps, or you can hold a lot of attention to a place where it's not such a big deal and we're looking at national, national missions. So that's something that uh, was emphasized by participants. However, that doesn't mean that the way of implementing it should be national. Because you can clearly, when looking at the national scale, identify areas that have clearly distinct dynamics. So you can have, for example, in Colombia, a specific dynamics in the Amazon region. But when you look at the Andes, the dynamics are different. Therefore, if you use a carpet approach towards the national level, you might be missing something important. Whereas if you, you separate both, then you might be able to perhaps think of better ways of really achieving emissions reductions. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Now, <clears throat> key point, uh, red countries are just learning how to report under the convention. We are all just learning, actually, how to report. We're all just learning how to how to um, how to uh, go through these reports. Even the technical assessment team members and one recently were recognizing that. In many cases, they are doing their country's reference levels at the same time as they are assessing other countries' reference levels. So this is actually a peer review process. And we need to keep that in mind. So all the countries, I think, we need uh, to be humble about how we deal about this information, highlight the issues, but then we have to go how to move uh, forward. And that takes us to the verification validation discussion. Uh, there was a lot of frustration by some participants on how the verification validation was taken into consideration in some cases. Uh, but the agreement was like, we need to be uh, propositive, keep an eye on things, provide feedback where it needs to happen. But uh, countries are looking for, for that because basically we're trying to figure out how to do things. So if we propose something, uh, well, uh, keep in mind that perhaps you can say, well, this is not the best way to do this. Perhaps you should do it this way. So we're all, we're all in the learning process for both reporting countries, but also validating countries or reporting uh, technicians and validating technicians, particularly when in some cases uh, one individual is playing both, both roles. So we're all involved in that. So that's why we were carrying out this workshop on lessons learned from all the on reference level uh, design, for example, and technical assessment, uh, because um, mm, this needs to be kept in mind. So no one has done this on this topic or on the current frameworks. So keep things to keep in mind. The validation process, uh, it was agreed by the participants that it should aim at enhancing the quality of the data and its use. Not just fisca not fiscalization, but really trying to figure out how to best move. And then when finding a problem, a solution should be proposed as part of the validation process. And then um, the country's effort for doing well has to be recognized. And then countries bear the responsibility of using the best possible approaches. By, but, but by possible, that means that it needs to be viable. And that links all the way back to country circumstances. So 
that's how as you do know our kind of message in that key mode and revalidation. And that's linked with uncertainties. Key strong message is that uncertainties are not the way of validating something. So it's a validation exercise goes right away to looking at your uncertainty estimates. And then based on that, it's the only aspect that we're going to be considering to say what the country is reporting is right or wrong or is it legitimate or not. I think you're only going to be, and participants agree on that, um, looking at um, the partial picture of things. Uh, basically, and it can become even a perverse incentive. So you could manipulate your uncertainty estimates into making uncertainties look good when there's, for example, bias in your in your data, and you're not being transparent about that. So uh, the participants agree that more than really trying to uh, making the conversation about the validation and about validity of the data, being about uncertainty. Uh, the conversation should be about full transparency and also about having a complete picture. Is, is this that's being proposed, given the attributes of the data, uh, legitimate uh, or not? So that's something that uh, participants were adamant about. That, and the only way of learning by doing and learning from other countries' experiences is uh, if countries are actually transparent and honest about, okay, hey, this is our best effort. This is what we're doing, what we think. And that's where it needs to be taken. Uh, we need to learn with uncertainty, clear message, because it's not going to go away. It's always going to be too high. Once again, it could be a potential incentive too much focus on reducing uncertainties has become, in some cases, a perverse incentive. Uh, again, uncertainty is not analog to validity. Uh, but then we identified a big gap, which is uh, how to make sound use of data with high uncertainties, but still do so in a legitimate way. And, uh, and there is a feeling among the MRB, not only the participants in this workshop, but also in the one involved recently that uh, we have a gap there. We need to come up with smart ways of being capable of using the data that we have. Because what's happening, and some participants were saying, is that uh, we are not reporting on the Galatian because uncertainties are so high that we'd rather not say anything because everybody's going to hate our numbers. Well, that's bad. It's worse. I'd rather, I'd rather have access to your estimates and then figure out what to do with them than not have anything because then all issues like linkage and things like that cannot be addressed. So um, something to keep in mind. Um, there was agreement that uh, internal national validation is an interesting thing to happen in countries. So not, not just waiting for validation from the international community, but also local, local stakeholders and the community in general is an interesting uh, asset that can be used to work the validation. And that's clearly linked with uh, compliance with transparency, but also with social safeguards. And there was a feeling that if you have buy into the information that you're producing, there's knowledge on how to use the information. And there's agreement that it use is adequate in country. It's going to help you move forward towards the sound design and implementation of mitigation actions. Uh, you will have better access to field data to enhance your data, and also you're going to be uh, on a good track to uh, design sound implementation actions, but also compliance with that safeguards. So this is just means to say, hey, MRV does not end only in delivering data. Perhaps um, the validation process is a good way of uh, of uh, moving forward and actually having a say in the way the data. On country capacities, uh, basically the point is use the tools you know and understand. Uh, particularly when you face the, the five principles of consistency, transparency, comparability, completeness, and accuracy, uh, the, the message here is that it's better to use the devil you know than the one that you're just learning to figure out. Uh, and that has to do um, with the fact that you need to aim towards a sustained capacity. So there's been a lot of exposure to emergent technologies. 
uh, lots of research and development, but when you face with the fact of transparency, comparability, and things like that, there's a lot of black boxes that countries are dealing with, and then when you have to report on the, the five principles, uh, it doesn't go well. Uh, and so cutting edge methods have a lot of unknowns, you know, and then there's the small sample sizes, the peer review process is, is not perfect. Uh, data accessibility issues when you're working with academics that are still waiting for polishing their papers and things like that, and the findings do not fit with or match what countries are supposed to do in order to have to proceed, and things like that. Recognize the limitations of the methods uh, that are proposed. Sometimes when they're under development, well, you don't know the limitations, but you think it's like, I don't know, kind of an answer. So um, it's better to use to do research, to do uh, research for uh, testing potential approaches, but for reporting, uh, it's it's probably better to, to to go back to well-known technologies and methods that you can really answer questions like, okay, what's where are the strengths and weaknesses of your approach, and how do you propose to use the database and that kind of thing. So. And that's that's a good point. And then when you are talking about building capacities as countries have been exposed to, well, think about the the current beyond the current project. A lot of the capacities in countries have been enhanced uh, through through capacity building uh, through projects, and that's not for the long haul uh, whole process. And then when the project is done, well, what happens? And that has to do with institutionalization of uh, of the MOD process. A lot of the process the project countries. Uh, reported that, oh, well, this is a project funded by a foreign donor, but we don't really know where the money is going to come from when this is done. Finally, uh, participation. Uh, uh, participants were um, agreed that participation in the MRV process is a means to build capacity to engage and implement. Uh, an example was what I was mentioning about the verification validation uh, process. So rather than, than engaging into developing parallel uh, MRV approaches, like different MRVs, uh, different scales, and then it's a nightmare to try to put all data together, uh, perhaps the, uh, the way is to really render the MRV exercise as a national endeavor, national as nation, not as a, a government agency endeavor only, but really uh, an endeavor in which participation by the general public is, is enabled somehow. And that's going to you know, have impacts that will well be on the data and the quality of the data that we're producing. And actually, that's one of the main aspects that we're going to be working in the next five years. So the overall, just to finish, oof, I've taken quite a bit, uh, uh, are basically, uh, first and foremost, it's all about transparency. No matter what you're doing, try to be transparent so you get good feedback and then there's a possibility to use uh, uh, good data. As the participants say, you can have the best quality data in the world and not be transparent about it and propose illegitimate ways of using it to define reference levels, reporting emissions reductions, or benefit sharing. Whereas another country with very basic data, with high uncertainty levels, can still propose some use approaches that result in, in legitimate developments. The second one is a uh, uh, link with the validation and the participation is like MRV is a national endeavor, it's a national. It's not just an agency versus another one. And then the third one is uh, the readiness phase continues. I mean, we're delivering data, but we're just learning how to use it. And, and the reporting is something that we're just learning to do under the UNF uh, C Red Cross uh, framework. So, and that includes donors. Donors need also to be humble in the way they react to countries reporting, and also humble in the way they use the data for their decision making. And I just want to end with uh, this quote that I like from E.F. Schumacher, which is, I use it frequently in my presentation, uh, which is, uh, emphasizes the way we work, which is trying to find uh, simple yet good enough solutions for the problems that we're dealing with. So an intelligent tool can make things bigger, more complex, and more violent. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Nikoa. That was a lot of really great information, compacted pretty well into 50 minutes. I have to say, I'm impressed. The last time we ran through this presentation, it took a bit longer for those of you who are listening. So that was actually the speed version um, of Nikoa's presentation. Um, a couple of you have already sent in questions. Um, if you have additional questions as Nikoa is talking, please feel free to send them in. Um, if we can't get to all of them before the end of the hour, don't worry, I will make NICOA answer them and I will put them up on the link to the YouTube channel. So we'll answer as many as possible right now and then we'll circle back after. Um, the first question I want to put to you is, um, in your opinion, what are the most common, so maybe top three, mistakes or faulty assumptions in designing and implementing Red Plus MRV systems? So what are the big things people should watch out for? Well, wow, okay. <laughs> well, the first thing that comes to my mind is um, thinking that you're seeing, if you're using remote sensing data, thinking that you're seeing, seeing things from 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 the from the heavens, if you allow me the analogy, uh, gives you the godly knowledge on what's going on. Basically, if you're using remote sensing and you detect a change, assuming that you already know what's happening, uh, that's a very common mistake. And uh, detecting change is one thing, knowing exactly what's going on is another thing. So that's why I always emphasize the fact that you cannot use the, the change data as your at face value, but you really need to use context information uh, by incorporating other layers or uh, underground assessments to really understand if what you're looking at is uh, uh, actually deforestation or degradation, and then how to uh, use that information to data. And that's the, the very first thing. The second uh, thing is, uh, as I said, um, poor use of the forest definition. Um, we made a mistake that uh, thinking that aggregating pixels into hectares allows us to, to report on hectares of forest and things like that. But when you think from a management perspective, you're making a mistake because uh, when you're going to be implementing the linkage of the pixel to the implementing unit is not necessarily a straightforward one. So I think that it's a very common thing. And the other big mistake uh, that I see frequently is uh, the move always towards high spatial resolution or super high uh, uh, precision estimates uh, of things, particularly in the remote sensing side of things. Um, gives you uh, more accurate in data. And that happens a lot because uh, when you're not a remote sensing person, it's difficult to understand that perhaps coarser resolution data is actually better than, than that high special resolution data. I'm not going to get into details of why is that, but that's a very common mistake. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, another, so we have a few more technical questions, um, and I think the one that it's probably best for you to answer now is, when you're using sample data for reference emission levels and reporting, do you need to use exactly the same sample plots or pixels or just the same sampling method protocol? So how, when you were talking about comparing apples to apples, what kinds of apples are you talking about? Well, it depends on what you're using the sampling. Uh, if it's being used for activity data or for uh, emissions factors. Uh, for activity data, you don't have to use always the same samples. You could change the samples. You could do random samples. I mean, it's, there's no written in stone rules for that. What's important is whichever approach you use, have it very well uh, characterized in a transparent way, particularly in the sampling design, and then allow for others to really follow. We have. We have dealt with countries in which there's been samples being used, and, and we really don't know how the sampling approach has been done. So when you engage into assessing the accuracy of such exercises, it's almost impossible uh, because you really don't, there's no transparency on how things go down. Uh, so that's why that's what that's what I really emphasize first and foremost. Now, in terms of sampling design, and well, there's a lot of uh, references that you can you can follow uh, to do that in a scientific. Uh, and now, it, does it have to always be the same samples? Um, not really. Well, some, I mean, depends on whom you talk to. 
some 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 are especially Zalian probably yes, some others we are probably no. Uh, but that's clearly an area that we can discuss for here at some other time. For the for the car for the national forest inventory, uh, then there's a difference because it's interesting to have uh, at least a part of the samples to be the same always because we're talking about dynamic changes such as carbon sequestration and emissions. So it's interesting to have a, a data that allows you to estimate the rate of sequestration of carbon and biomass by, by forest and uh, different types, uh, depending on the strategy that you're dealing with. So it's, it's, you know, it depends on what you're talking about. OK, and then one last technical question along similar lines. Um, is it necessary to change the area of sample plots for every strata based on its density? This person is thinking particularly in the context of mountainous areas. Well, it depends on how much money you have. Um, one thing is the academic answer, which I would say, uh, well, it, it will be linked with the um, density and the structural heterogeneity of the forest type that you're dealing with. So basically what you're looking for is a large enough sample that is representative of what really constitutes a, 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 a sample of the structural heterogeneity and the carbon distribution of that specific stratum that you're dealing with. Uh, but that's easier said than done. I mean, uh, the inventories are extremely expensive and then logistically speaking, it's, it's, it's difficult. So that's why we in many cases use clusters and things like that in the hopes of covering as much as variation as possible with the, with the least amount of effort on the logistical resources uh, as possible. I don't know if that answers the question. Uh, well, I'm sure we can get follow-ups if um, they would like additional answers um, along those lines. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and ask um, what is considered an authentic reference level of emissions? What is the status of historic reference level of emissions for different countries in general? Well, uh, authentic depends on basically it's how you how you look at it. Uh, from being from WF, uh, I will give you my my metric. Does it aim at climate integrity or not? First and second, is it really something that you can use for actually reducing? emission as of right now because we need to reduce them right now or just aiming at, for example, cash flow towards the country. Uh, um, but then that authenticity might not be a suitable one for you as a user uh, or, or a participant in the, in the webinar. Uh, as, I, as I said, the reference level is a political decision. So some might consider the decision of a country of being compensated from past decisions uh, a good one. Some others might not. Some uh, would uh, consider an upward shifting uh, of the reference level based on country circumstances, uh, a legitimate one. Some others not, uh, and so on. But uh, from a climate integrity perspective, uh, well, uh, any of those uh, could be yes, helping towards climate integrity, or not really. So there's no, there's no single, there's no single answer. Um, that. If you ask me right now, from an assessment that we did of the reference levels that uh, have been submitted so far under the convention, um, there's no, not a whole lot of actual emissions reductions that are being offered or proposed. So. Uh, and then you have to decide if you like to do it. OK. Um, you mentioned the convention, so I'm going to toss this question in there. Um, it says, you said transparency is the key. Do you think that the convention decisions under which reference levels need to be assessed by countries ensure transparency and accuracy? In other words, do you believe reference levels can provide transparent and accurate avoided emissions estimates? The reference level itself will not. As I said, you can comply with the rules of the game and not be, you know, um, basically, well, there's two questions there. The first one, uh, the way transparency is being interpreted, for example, by the technical assessment teams is about it. You can reconstruct what is being presented as a reference record. And 
and uh, that's fine, that's okay. But basically, it allows you to really understand how this thing was put together, how the numbers were added up, what were the rationale behind country circumstances, and how you propose to modify it or change it, how you propose to restore it. But as long as it's, it's, it allows you to understand what's being proposed and then decide if you like it or not, that's good. But the reference level does not guarantee anything. You can have a reference level uh, that that is historical. That, 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 that they're all supposed to be historical. Let's say a reference level that um, to, uh, is the average of your last ten years, and then not do anything about it. Uh, the reference level is just the, you know, the line that you're asking to be assessed from. The, it doesn't guarantee you anything. Now, it can be manipulated, of course, and I think I get your point in your question, which is, okay, you can move it upwards, and then I just sit in my hands, and I expect for cash to be flowing. You can always do that, and then in itself, the representative can become a means to, to achieve benefit without being using it. And there's, there's a, the way it's being proposed to be used that you're looking for, not specifically. Uh, but, yeah. Um, there's no guarantee by it, by establishing a reference level that um, the parties in the right. All right. Um, well, it looks like we're at the end of our time today. We did have a few questions that we weren't able to get to, but um, just so the participants know, I will um, organize with NICOA to have um, him answer the questions, and then I'll post them in a link to a PDF um, uh, on the YouTube video. So um, we'll all be able to come back and revisit these questions because some of them are very detailed and some of them I think would be helpful um, to a wide audience as well. Um, so uh, Nyko, will you change the slide for me, please? Absolutely. Thank you. So um, I want to thank you, Nikoa, for sharing your expertise with our community. Um, as you all um, can appreciate, he is a vast wealth of knowledge, um, and I always learn something new when I talk to him. Um, and I also want to thank the participants for joining us today and sending in your really um, good questions. They're just good, meaty questions today. Um, you'll all receive a follow-up email in a few hours with some additional resources that are specific to this webinar. Um, along with a link to the YouTube channel. Next slide, please. Maybe, thank you. Um, and again, if you want to revisit this webinar or share it with colleagues, the recording will be up on our YouTube channel in about a day or so. And you can also find previous recordings of sessions there for additional enrichment. Next slide, please. So thank you again for joining us, and we hope you all have a great day. And we hope you join us again next time.